Thorium. There's so much excitement around thorium. It's the nuclear panacea. Every problem with nuclear power, from waste to proliferation to cost, can be solved by taking the uranium out of nuclear power and replacing it with thorium. But is that true? And if so, why don't we have thorium reactors? I'm going to look at Copenhagen Atomics, one of a handful of companies developing thorium reactors, and see if what they're doing matches up to the promises. They claim they'll have the first commercial reactor before the end of the decade. Is that plausible? First, a bit about Copenhagen Atomics. In 2014, a group of scientists and engineers began meeting in Copenhagen to discuss thorium and molten salt reactors. The interest in nuclear power in Denmark is interesting as a 1985 law there makes nuclear power illegal. So when Copenhagen Atomic builds their first test reactor with nuclear fuel, it won't be in Denmark, it'll be in Switzerland. It also means that Copenhagen Atomics can't recruit locally for people with experience in the nuclear industry. Since their approach is a significant departure from standard pressurized light water reactors, maybe that's an advantage. There are other efforts to develop thorium reactors, like Flib Energy and a Chinese effort. It's always hard to tell what's going on with projects in China. Flib has a very similar approach to Copenhagen Atomics, though using graphite instead of heavy water as the moderator. It seems to me that Copenhagen Atomics is the closest to having something commercial, so I'll focus there. Copenhagen Atomics' approach is a molten salt reactor similar to Kairos's using heavy water as a moderator. But instead of heavily enriched uranium in pebbles, their fuel is bred in the reactor from thorium and is mixed in with the molten salt. And all of the nuclear components will fit inside a 40-foot shipping container. So let's dig into the thorium fuel cycle. And let's start with the difference between fissile and fertile. If a neutron hits a nucleus and it splits, releasing more neutrons and energy, then the nucleus is fissile. Examples are uranium-235 and plutonium-239, both of which are important fuels in pressurized light water nuclear power plants. Fertile nuclei are ones that, when struck by a neutron, absorb it and transmute or convert the nucleus into a fissile isotope. For instance, in pressurized light water reactors, about 25% of the energy comes from when uranium-238, which is fertile, is struck by a neutron and it transmutes into plutonium-239, which is fissile. It releases energy when struck by a neutron. For a thorium reactor, other than a small amount of uranium or plutonium to get things going, the fuel is entirely derived from fertile thorium-232. When struck with a neutron, thorium-232 transmutes into protactinium-233, which decays into uranium-233 with a half-life of 27 days. Then the uranium-233 is burnt in the reactor. So a thorium reactor is a breeder reactor creating its own fuel at the same time it generates energy. This figure from Copenhagen Atomics does a pretty good job allowing us to see their approach. They call their reactor the onion core, and this is a cross-section of their onion. The onion core is about two and a half meters across. The inner layer is filled with heavy water, which is used to slow or moderate the neutrons. Slower neutrons are more likely to trigger reaction in the fuel and absorption by the thorium to breed more fuel. Heavy water is used because it absorbs fewer neutrons than regular or light water. This is the same reason that heavy water is used in the CANDU reactors. This zone is actively cooled to about 50 degrees C to keep the water from boiling. So there must be cold water flowing into the container and hot water flowing out. The next layer are the dark regions where the molten fluoride salt containing nuclear fuel interacts with thermal neutrons to fission, releasing heat and neutrons to further the reactions and transmute the thorium into protactinium-233. Initially, it will be the same fuel as powers most nuclear reactors, about 5% uranium-235 and 95% uranium-238. 
conceptually, it could be plutonium-239 from nuclear waste. But that's unlikely to happen since almost no one is reprocessing spent nuclear fuel, and the fuel derived from reprocessing can be burnt in almost any reactor. After the startup phase, the nuclear fuel will be uranium-233 derived from thorium. Unlike every commercial nuclear reactor, the fuel here is not a solid pebble or pellet, but is dissolved in the liquid molten salt. Chain reactions get going, heating the reaction zone to about 600 degrees C. Here we see an expanded view of the entire 40-foot container. When the molten salt leaves the onion, the neutrons to trigger the nuclear reaction aren't there, so the reactions slow down. But fission products will continue to decay. The hot salt passes its heat to an intermediate loop, which then passes the heat to a loop going to customers, who can use it in a steam turbine to generate electricity or an industrial process. Then the molten salt mixture returns to the reaction zone inside the onion, and the nuclear reactions start up again, heating the salts back up to 600 degrees C. Over time, the salt in the reactor zone is depleted of fissile fuel and filled with fission products that are highly radioactive. Too many fission products in the salt can capture neutrons, poisoning the reactor. Some of these fission products are gaseous, like xenon, and can be removed while the reactor is running. In a traditional reactor, after about two years, they would shut the reactor down and remove the spent fuel. But supposedly, this reactor can be run continuously and be refueled while working. Because the thorium reactor requires more neutrons, the problem of fission products poisoning the reaction is more critical than it is for a light water reactor. Whether just removing the volatile fission products like xenon is sufficient is unclear. As we move out, we have another layer of heavy water so that neutrons headed outwards are also slowed. The final layer is a blanket of the same salt that is used in the reaction zone, except it has no nuclear fuel, and instead has fertile thorium, which is transmuted to protactinium-233 when struck by a neutron. This will decay to fissile uranium-233, which can be injected into the inner reaction zone. But the details in this zone are unclear. And while Copenhagen Atomics gives very little information about what's happening in the blanket, Philb Energy actually has a pretty good description of how they plan to separate the protactinium from the thorium. In their design, a fairly simple electrochemical process can be used to remove the protactinium and add thorium back to the salt. And it's likely the Copenhagen Atomics will take a similar approach. The most important question is how is the protactinium-233 managed? If it's kept in a fairly pure state waiting to decay to uranium-233, there's a chance that the uranium-233 could actually reach critical mass and a runaway chain reaction begin. That's a nice way of saying a nuclear explosion. Designing a system where this is impossible will be critical for the acceptance of thorium reactors. Is there room in the 40-foot shipping container for a chemical plant to separate out the protactinium and store it safely away from neutrons until it decays to uranium-233 in a way that doesn't create a bomb? It isn't shown in any schematics that Copenhagen Atomics has shared. But dealing with this issue is critical for thorium reactors. If you don't remove the protactinium-233 soon enough, it can absorb another neutron and transmute into uranium-244, which is not fertile or fissile. And if you remove some of the thorium-232 with the protactinium-233 and you inject it into the reactor zone, it will absorb multiple neutrons without releasing any energy. One thing is clear, they haven't worked on this in Denmark, where a reactor that could create protactinium-233 would be illegal. Separating out the protactinium and waiting it for decay to uranium-233 is a proliferation concern as well, since the uranium-233 can theoretically be made into a weapon. So how they deal with taking the irradiated blanket salts and extracting the nuclear fuel is important and unclear.
One of the often expressed upsides of the thorium fuel cycle is you don't need to mine uranium and then enrich it. Thorium is much more common and is co-located with valuable targets of the mining industry like rare earth elements. The one wrinkle to this is there's no market for thorium, so there's no infrastructure to separate out the thorium from the ore. New processing plants will be needed, but no new holes in the ground. I think the biggest advantage of the thorium fuel cycle is the much lower abundance of the long-lived radioactive waste like plutonium-239. That's because fertile uranium-238 isn't in the fuel mix, so it's hard to get the transuranic elements. There's some because a small percentage of the uranium-233 will absorb a neutron rather than fission, becoming uranium-234, which can absorb another neutron to become uranium-235. Uranium-235 will probably fission when it absorbs a neutron, but some will transmute to uranium-236, and these items might end up becoming long-lived nuclear waste. So there's some, but about 1 20th as much as a traditional reactor. Another upside of the molten salt reactors is that if they lose power, then the pump stop and gravity drains the heavy water needed for moderating the neutrons and molten salt into tanks outside of the core. This will stop most of the fission reactions. But they'll still need a system to take away the heat of the decaying fission product. They believe at this point, passive cooling will be sufficient to prevent a meltdown. In a light water reactor, you need one neutron to trigger energy release. But in a thorium reactor, you need one to convert the thorium to protactinium and another to trigger the reaction in the uranium-233. So designers have gone to great effort to conserve neutrons, making sure each one does something valuable. First, they use heavy water because the deuterium in the heavy water doesn't absorb neutrons the way that hydrogen in regular or light water can. The other thing they do is they use lithium-7 in the fluoride salt. This is the most common isotope of lithium, but it must be enriched to a very high purity, removing all of the lithium-6. This is because the lithium-6 can absorb a neutron and emit an alpha particle and tritium, which is great if you're trying to make tritium, but not so great if you're trying to preserve neutrons. Since there's currently no commercial supply chain for enriched lithium-7, they'll have to build their own factory to separate the lithium-6 and 7. As a side note, if any of the fusion companies succeed, most of them need tritium, which might create a very robust market for the lithium-6 that Copenhagen Atomics will be in a great position to fill. So the nuclear waste has less of the long-lived transuranic issues. The fission products from uranium-233 are even more problematic than the fission products from uranium-235 used in a standard reactor. And since hot salts get very corrosive if there's just a little bit of water mixed in, a giant swimming pool is probably not the best solution for the early stages of the spent fuel. I couldn't find much from Copenhagen Atomics on how they plan to deal with their spent fuel. They believe that long-term geological storage is not needed since it has very little of the transuranic elements like plutonium, which have the very long lifetime. They also say they plan to manage the waste for the first century and then return it to the country of origin for storage beyond that. But they don't give any indication on how they plan to store it or what happens if they go bankrupt. Copenhagen Atomics is in the process of building a test reactor in Switzerland where they can actually study some of these complex issues that they don't discuss. And they can't effectively study in Denmark due to the prohibition on dealing with nuclear power. I'm certain that nothing I said here would be a surprise to them. They've thought of all of these issues, they understand them, and they may or may not have solutions that they just aren't sharing with the public. Judging just from what they've shared, I don't think they're anywhere close to having a working reactor. Just the issue of separating the protactinium from the thorium 
without creating a safety or proliferation issue might be enough to kill the effort. Going from their first test reactor that actually can be radioactive to a commercial reactor in five years, which is what they claim they will do, is just not reasonable. Even if they were successful, I can't imagine any national authority approving such a plant quickly. There's almost no expertise in molten salt reactors or uranium-233, so there will be some heavy lifting to get this reactor approved. The regulators will be looking carefully at how they manage the uranium-233, both in terms of proliferation and in terms of accidental achievement of critical mass. For most nuclear reactors, blowing up like a nuclear weapon is impossible. For their reactor, I'm not so sure, but they will need to prove that. And the fission products are different enough from what we've been dealing with with light water reactors that an entirely new paradigm will have to be created to deal with spent fuel. And a pool is unlikely to be a good idea for the first stage. But you will still need to transport away large amounts of heat from the decay of the fission product. I don't see anything for the thorium reactors that Copenhagen Atomics wants to build it's a showstopper. But I see lots of challenges and I don't see evidence that they've been overcome. Enough challenges remain that I think their cost estimates are worthless. I also see that the biggest selling point of thorium, that you don't need to mine uranium anymore, is kind of a weak sauce. It's true that thorium is much more common than uranium, but uranium is common enough. And if there really is a problem with uranium availability, a fast neutron reactor like the natrium reactor that can burn uranium-238 seems like a much simpler solution than this does. Of the three companies I've reviewed, Natrium, Kairos, and Copenhagen Atomics, they seem the furthest from having something commercial. I can imagine Natrium and Kairos scaling in the middle of the next decade. I can imagine Copenhagen Atomics having a functional prototype for the first time sometime in the next decade. If you think I'm being unfair to Copenhagen Atomics or Thorium in general, please leave a note in the comments. If you've learned something, please like and subscribe. If you didn't like the video, feel free to hit thumbs down, but I'd appreciate a comment to let me know what you didn't like about my video. If you want to support my work, you can buy me a Guinness. And if you want to learn more about nuclear power, you can check out my playlist here. And please share this video with anyone you know who has strong thoughts, pro or con, on nuclear power.